This is looking up a chimney. This chimney is about 20 feet high. So there's room enough for Santa and his pack. Unfortunately, all the heat goes up that chimney once the thing has uh, died down a bit. This is a close-up of that. Hook for the crane, right here. Mazarol house at the village Acadien, Caracet. It's a hand hewn square house, square house, log house. Uh, but they've taken seashells and ground them up to lime, mixed them with sand to make a mortar, and gone over all the cracks with that. So it gives them a kind of a rounded look, but it's all flat. And then over that, then they would put the, uh, the vertical boards. We did that here as well. Uh, but we had to use flax lime, and sometimes they use clay. Uh, in between the logs, they would take flax and wet it, twist it, lay it down, and then pound the next log down on to create a seal, and then fill in between. Yeah. Um, was the flax um, ever? ever kind of wedged in between the logs with um, I, I wouldn't doubt it. Kind of like a cleaver, but um, um, a wooden cleaver that had kind of an angle edge. It could. It sounds like you've seen something like that. Yeah. It's enough of a description, so it kind of gives it away that. So, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it because, like I say, Every house has different solutions for the same problems. This is a round log building. See where the corners extend just a little bit? This is for pigs. This is a pig stop. So when they built a replica of the first chapel at St. Basil, in the cemetery of St. Joseph, and they named it a round log. I'm so insulted by it. <laughs> because that's for pigs. That's what that means to me. That is for pigs. And people took a lot more pride in their churches than pigsties, that's for sure. But this is a pigsty. Why round for pigs? Well, they're animals, <laughs> they can take the cold. I guess that was what they were believing. Shows you how they, well, but even that is not an American log, huff log solution. The American log solution is completely different, a different kind of joint. It just goes, it, it go, going through the upper part. Only the log on the top has the groove into it. Where the American one has groove on both. This is that other solution with the square log. You've got the butting up. This is tiny groove. The uh, tongue here, and you see the way it fits into the groove. This is a house of Olivier Sear in Madawaska, about 1850. solution where you have planks with pegs. This is 
another solution. This is in Barret. Barret, right near Edmonton. Uh, between Edmonton and uh, St. Silet. You see it's on Colombage. You have the corner post. Right here. And what is this? It's cordwood. It's cordwood stacked in between these posts with mortar in between the cordwood. The problem is the cordwood would then split and then you get air coming in through the splits. And so they put stucco over it. So this is stucco. Uh, this seems to be in Paris and in Frenchville. There used to be a barn in Frenchville like this, which was destroyed about 25 years ago. I didn't get a chance to photograph it. So I went right over to Valais and I'll photograph this right away. And there's another one uh, behind uh, Karen Lutcarl, up in there, uh, right. There's one road that goes down to the cottages, and, and there's another way in, and it's in between the two, the other first one. It's a big bar. Yeah, that is that same kind of thing. The only example left. This this has been destroyed. Oh, a good 12, 16 inches, depending on how long, how wide they made the logs. You know, you know when you cut cordwood. This is a front-on version of it. It's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful design. It's a great solution. But again, this is for barn. This is the Olivier Sear house in uh, Madawaska. It's actually in the back side of the Ontario Road. Pretty, the exterior is pretty similar to every other one. This is the interior. You see the board walls, vertical boards, and then there's a molding that holds them together because these are all tiny little boards together. And very often, in this one, this was a light, app, like Granny Apple's, uh, Granny Smith apple green, and the bottom is barn red. Uh, but both colors are muted colors, and it's a beautiful combination. This is their solution for the eaves. They've employed things that look like ship that are ship's knees, but they go up and they hold the rafters. And the rafter cantilevers out over it. This is the wall. And then it comes back in, and then the fascia is underneath that. That's, that's, that was unique. Was there a rule on um, um, the, the size or, or how it? it, it that one looks like it was um, it was moved to fit in the log against the wall. Yeah. And was there the, a not a, not necessarily a rule, but it's you know how they managed to do it. They they, they used whatever size they had. Yeah. They did with it. They had solved the problem any way they could. And every house has a different solution. This is for stovepipe. I'm looking straight up from the house, looking up toward the roof. And this big field stone, big flat, flat piece of shale, is up there with a hole in it. And the stove pipe goes up right into that. And on top of that, they put stones that went out through the roof. So the chimney is only this tall. And the Elbear House in St. David is done the same way. Um, but we have, very often they have uh, posts coming down to reinforce it. Depends on the place. Um, but I have one, I have, I have this one at, at my house, it's in my attic. They let me take it. I said, you can have that if you want. I said, it was spelled out by it. I said, you can have that if you want. And I said, I said uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and I hauled it over there myself. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do when, when you have the chance. This is a later house. 
the Joseph Sear House in St. David. This Joe Sear was a, a furniture maker. He made lots of beautiful furniture. He's the only person I know of that made furniture and sold it. So you could say he was a cabinet maker or a furniture maker. Uh, but this house is completely has completely rotted away now. But this is the way it looked at the time. This is the interior, part of the interior, you can see it's beadboard. So that a lot of that was put on at the turn of the century, turn of the, the 20th century. Before the First World War. But you see this thing that looks like a mantle? This is a door, and behind this is the wood stove in the other room. So when you want heat in this room, you open these doors up. This one goes flush with that, this goes flush with this wall, and you get heat from the back of the stove coming into that room. And you can see how they're not doing the beadboard vertically or horizontally, they're doing it diagonally. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Just, just to make it different. Just to, and uh, it would also be stronger too. You put a diagonal over something square and it, it uh, tends to work better. Makes it a little bit stronger. On the church in Lille, the boards that go over the, uh, the, the wall boards, it's two pieces of pine thick, but all diagonal. The two boards that of the whole building. This is looking right up into the roof. You can see how the roof boards are spaced. And you can see the shingles, the wood shingles on the roof in between. And this goes from one beam to the next as a diagonal to, re to keep that beam straight. When you put, uh, because in the old bear house we had to put the, roof, the rafters up and that had that as well. And we realized when we put those up why that was there. Because you get the first one up, and you get the second one up, you get that diagonal in, and it holds it in place. And then after that, you can add the rest. But keeping that first one up and the second one, if you're not, it's impossible. And two people were able to do that. But the other thing is, is it cuts down on the weight of the roof, having these space. It cuts down on the weight of the roof, which means that the pressure on the sides of the house is much less, because these houses want to spread out, like the Elbert house. Uh, that had to, the sides had to be brought back because the uh, ship's knees weren't doing it enough, and that had spread what, four inches or so because of the way they were moving. Uh, and uh, so they wanted to keep that roof as light as they can. And the other plus is these shingles dry from the back, and these shingles will last a hundred years. Whereas if you put the boards right next to each other and don't have those spaces, they'll last 20 years. Know that from the Acadian village. The Roy House, they were spaced. Only they were little, little pieces of uh, cedar logs split in half, just little things, four inches wide. And they were four inches in between. Real and four feet. And then said, we're not going to work on that roof. It's got to be solid. So they made it solid. And I couldn't talk them out of it. But luckily, the roof is not so heavy that it spreads the walls. But but it should. But they've had to replace the roof already because of it. You know, the roof, the roof shingles. Is that probably why we had to replace the porch on the top of the Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that and the squirrel problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, squirrels can do a lot of damage. Here's, a, here's one way of talking about the, uh, this is the Joe Sear house. This is that stovepipe stone, and then you see the uh, chimney going up from there. And you see the poles coming down to hold that, because, it's, because the chimney is heavy. Here's another shot of the same thing. I can do without the slides, because I have everything here as well. This is the Maison Corbier in Lille. 
This house is behind Gerard Millette's house. This house is really unique. Um, and I was able to, to uh, Gerard said, Don, do whatever you want. Go in there and take whatever you want. And so I went in and I cleaned it up. And, uh, but the mouse, mice and rats had gotten into the logs and hollowed them out so it wasn't, the logs weren't salvageable. So they ended up, you know, destroying it. But I got, beds are rare. I got beds out of that place. And shows you upstairs. You see the ship's knees here? There are also ship's knees in every corner, going around the corner horizontally. Mm -hmm. So you can see the rafters. This is the upstairs, and you can uh, see the floor going down through, so the boards have been taken out. This house is really in, in bad shape. It's now a garden spot. What year was that? Uh, I think it's the 1840s. This is a corner. You see the ship's knees, yeah. and then the braces as well. Yeah. That's why this house, I mean, despite the fact that the logs are all hollow, it's still square. I mean, it's still, still uh, true. It isn't sagging or anything like that. This is the Elbear House in St. David. I helped move that house back in, must have been 78. 1978, 1979, Mike Sear and I moved in. Now, the Elmer House is unusual because it's not a hand-hewn log house. It's a sawn log house. The Yellow Bears had money. And so rather than doing the free labor of hand-hewing, they're having a hydraulic sawmill to saw all of their logs. So these are all logs here, but they're all sawn logs. And then these are the exterior uh, pine boards. This is the roof going on. You can see that bird, that, those pieces, uh, those diagonal pieces that hold everything together. That was backwards. <laughs> shows you the uh, cutting groove logs, and you can see the saw marks. And that's not the thickness of the log. The logs are thicker than that. The cutting groove is only half of the log. The rest is abutted, or it goes at a 45 degree angle, or, or something like that. So the house is really a combination of uncolombage and pièce sur pièce. This is the staircase. The kitchen staircase, the back staircase, doesn't take up much room. And it's great for passing furniture up and down because there are very few obstructions. In Holland, all of the staircases are like this. But in Holland, they have huge windows. And when they want to move, the windows open like doors. And you have a beam that sticks out from the roof of the house with a hook on it. And they just hook furniture in bring it in, hook it, go out the window, and into a truck. I, saw, I was sat in a restaurant once and saw them move a whole household in an hour. That way, it's clever, it's Dutch. This is a central beam over the door. This is next to the door in the elder house. Again, you see the vertical saw marks on the logs very well. And you see, again, this tiny room going up through the, this huge beam across the top that the roof is going to set in. And the porch is right out here. And this is what split. This piece split. And that's what caused that wall to go up. And it had to use metal pieces to bring it back in. Ship's knee. Of course, these ship's knees are made from tamarack trees. You take the tamarack tree and the root so that you have this brace. And then you cut along the root and along the tree, and you've got this perfectly rigid corner. Thing. And they use these on sailing ships. This was a huge export from this region. You don't hear about it too much. Uh, but, oh yeah, they were making these and they were sending them down uh, to St. John. And then they would be used in shipbuilding. 
Yeah. And they use them in their, in their houses as well because they, and this technology was brought in from Quebec. You don't find this in other communities. So we really are a plan. So when we talk about the houses, these are Madawaskan houses. And the Elbar house is, you see, a house starts off to be a shelter, to shelter you from the uh, elements, those little dirt floors and things like that. Then it becomes a, a workspace. So when you start getting the, uh, the wooden floors in and you have a special room where the, wheat, the loom is up all the time, the spinning wheels are there all the time. You don't use that room in the winters too much, uh, except for work. So the house becomes a workspace. And you spend most of your time out of the house, even eight outside the house a lot. And then it becomes a comfortable space where that room that had the loom in it, maybe the loom is just there seasonally. You just use it in the winter, but in the summer, you put the loom in the attic. Uh, or maybe you're just weaving in the attic from then on. And, and that other room becomes a more comfortable space. When you have wood stoves, you can heat more of the house, okay? And then you begin to get luxury spaces. And the Elmer house is the beginning of a luxury space. They were well off. Uh, they had money. They, uh, I think there was a grist mill and a sawmill right next to the farm. In fact, back before they moved that house, back the centennial in 1969, Madawaska Centennial, um, if they would have gotten, if they could have been able to organize. You see, the problem is, is we didn't know anything about a human architecture back in 1969. No one, uh, no one had ever saved a house or anything like that anywhere. And um, and so they started to tear the house down. And when they did, they said, "Wow, this is not what we expect, and we're going to save." It. But the roof was already off. They had already stripped the interior out and all that kind of stuff. So, but if they could have organized right then and kept it right there, because they had that house, and behind it was the older house with a stone chimney and stone fireplace. They had an American barn, and then they had an old Acadian barn. And then right next to the farm on the brook, there was a grist mill, and there was a lumber mill, a sawmill. Everything was right there. Everything was right there. Now nothing's there. There's a church there and a courthouse. And you know that district court in that was. That's where it was. It's a shame. And uh, when they moved it, I went up and I looked at the foundation. I wish I could have taken a photograph of it. But I took a look at the foundation and it was like the foundation in the Lawrence Sear house. I gotta get a move on here. This is the house in Keegan. Uh, house and barn, log house. Pick up bulldozed one day, and I stopped, I was on my way home, and I saw them bulldozing it. And I got out and I asked the bulldozer operator, I said, you need someone to clear the boards out from your lives. He said, yeah. So he was doing that, and any time I saw anything, I liked to hold it off. I hold the ship's knees off, I hold a great big beam with the ship's knees on it off, and I say everything I possibly could. And, and the owner came by and said, what are you doing? Get away from there, I said. And the bulldozer officer said, leave him alone, he's helping me. <laughs> he says, it cost you double. If he wouldn't be doing this work, it would cost you double, because they'd be getting down, off because boards are getting in the lags and things like that. You know, so. You have to do sometimes. Sometimes you can't even. This house in Madawaska, the Adana house. I've been watching, looking at that house for years. And I never had the courage to knock on the door. And say, can I see your house? I mean, it's kind of rude. Yeah. You know? And then if you want to take photographs of it, it's even worse. Oh, I didn't do the month, the grand menage, you know? And uh, so I was going by one day, I was taking uh, classes at the Centre du Maillet, and uh, I was going by, I just got out of class, it was 11 in the morning, and the front door to this house was wide open. I said, now's my chance. So I scooted in that door, and when I lived in that door, two little kids next door came and said, 
why are you in my grandmother's house? And I said, is your mother here? I said, yeah. I said, could you get her? And she did, and it was obvious that, I said, what's going on? And she said, this house is going to be bulldozed at 3 this afternoon. And I said, uh, can I, can I take some of the lumber inside? She said, you can take anything you want. I said, do you have a crowbar and a hammer and an axe? She said, yep. She went and got them. And I took off my sweater and I went in and I completely stripped the entire, entire interior in three hours. But I had done these houses before. And what I did is I, you remove the moldings off the room and you take the door frame off and then over the door, there are usually a couple of boards that are about this high and this wide, and you just destroy those. And once you get those destroyed, the rest, you take the, the molding, the chair molding, the chair rail off around, and there's nothing holding them together. They're just toenailed to the ceiling and to the floor. And you can take those boards by the tongue side, and you can yank it at an angle, and pull those boards and just throw that back. Oh. And I did that and took them all outside, and the, and the ceiling was like a door. The entire ceiling was like a door. It's what I call a connect ceiling. And it has these uh, ridges that go down and then panels that are inserted into them. And they're about eight inches wide. They're beautiful, beautiful ceilings. But they're all square nailed. And uh, so I get in there, I got everything stripped. The wall's all stripped and I get in there with my hand and I'm reaching because that's how high it was. Reaching and I start prying a little bit. You pry a little bit, you put it back, and pry, put it back. And when you put it back, it doesn't go back enough, but it ties the next nail out a little bit more. And those square nails, once they let go a little bit, there's nothing to hold them. And so these boys, and those four or five years old, watching, I said, You better stand back. And they said, Okay. And I went, <clears throat> and the whole ceiling down on the floor. A whole ceiling, just one yank, and the whole thing came down. And they said, Superman! <laughs> I said, no, Desperate Man is what it is. <laughs> Where was that house located? This is right next to the historical site. It's like, there's a, there's the Chasse House, the, the Tom Blige Museum, the Chasse House, the next place. And the problem, the problem was, is these, you can see it right here. See the top of that window right here it seems to be rolled a little bit. That whole side was rolled a little bit. And the bulldozer came in. They caught this, tried to tear out that corner, but he couldn't do it. He tried going through the middle, and he couldn't do it. And so he went back to that corner and just gently shoved it. And he ended up pushing it back, and he turned that house off the foundation completely in reverse. So the front door was facing the river, and when it laid down on the ground, everything straightened out. They could have put a chain around that house and dragged it oh. to the town of Museum. Mm -hmm. And it would have, would have held together. That was so well built. But it was built by, by the Elder House, only hand human. The same idea as the Elder House. But you know what, underneath, it had a stone foundation, underneath, and then there was another foundation, a foundation that was six feet wide, and I think about 20 feet, 20 feet by six feet, no door going in. So what do you suppose that was used for? Hiding liquor. <laughs> so this house is after the 1850s, mainly Prohibition 1851. So that tells you that this house is probably after the 1850s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cellar that hides in the curtains. It's right here. Uh. <laughs> no way to get into that. And when you get into the other cellar, it looks like you've got a complete cellar. Uh. There are, there's a house here in uh, Fort Kent that's like that. I can't tell you who it is because so the same family know? is still in it. Yeah, and no one's probably not in it. Yeah. Trap door. Trap door. Trap door. The, one in, the one here in Fort Kent. The, uh, the, the farmer's wife was a school teacher, and she just had a baby. 
and the revenue was still coming up through and they told them, uh, you know, more of the revenue was still coming up through, they were checking sellers, that kind of thing. And so she uh, went and woke up the baby. It was a rug over the trap door. She put a rocking chair over the rug. Mm -hmm. She sat down in it. She pulled out her breast. Mm -hmm. She pitched the baby to make it cry. She put the baby to her breast. And when the revenuers came to the back door, uh, they said, oh, they were so embarrassed <laughs> that her breast was exposed and the baby was suckling from her breast. And she said, uh, the doors, it's the cellar right over there. She over there and she's rocking on the trap door. <laughs> and they go down and the cellar's completely clean. Uh -huh. Nothing in it. But there was a there, but the the cellar under that part of the kitchen was full of it. It had just been filled the night before. That's why they were coming up through it, because they had heard about it. They got away with it. She was a respectable school teacher. Which goes to show you that Catholics did not believe in prohibition. Do you know why? You drink wine at communion. Why can you drink wine at communion? But you can't have it in your own house with dinner. Why is it against the law to have it in your own house with dinner? This is the this is a house in Barre, Maison à Marchand. This has been all these windows have been changed. It's been vinylized. The porch has been enclosed. All this filigree work around the uh, dormer is gone. I never got into this house, but it's a house. Every time I go by, I look at it and go, boom. You see the motifs? Yeah. Clubs and spades? Yeah. yeah. This is a more of a luxury house. This is the front door. The windows on each side of the Elbert house are exactly like this. And um, and the and in St. Basil, the convent house was exactly like this. Almost across the river from, well, just adjacent across the river from the Elbert house. This is the Yellow Violet House, that's me on the roof. This is 1869. There was a picture window here. Some twit threw a uh, piece of ice through it and broke the window. But I lived in this house for one, one season. No water, no electricity. I was laying in bed one morning, looking up at the ceiling, and a fly leg fell off the ceiling into my eye. Oh. The fly leg has barbs in it. All kinds of sharp barbs into my eye. And here I'm in a house with no water. Oh. I tried spitting in the air and catching it in that eye. <laughs> Did everything I could. But I ended up driving myself. I taped it up. I wanted to dig that eye out so bad. Uh, I taped the eye up and I went to the hospital in Evanston. And they removed it and I had a real patch. It has really scarred the eye off. But I tore that house down with a ladder. What I did is I tore down the chimney from inside. And then when I got it, the chimney down to about this height, I then climbed on the chimney and went up through the chimney hole and then started shoveling the uh, shingles on off the roof. That's an odd line. What? That's an odd line. Yeah, it's because it has side lights, like the Elmer House. Mm -hmm. The side lights on each side and on the top. And of course, it has this dental over the around at the top. And this is the log house. You can see the vertical boards here. These boards were an inch and a half thick, and 16 feet long and two feet wide, and over end kind of thing. Incredible, I have, I have that in storage. I 
like to put it up sometime. Hopefully it's still in, in reasonable condition, but everything's numbered and took a month to tear it down. I learned more about these houses doing that than anything. This is it mostly torn down. You can see that has you know, go through the way the logs overlap like at the Roy house. So the ship's knees. It's Vital Viola. Aloha was, I think, original, the original one who built it. This is the interior. You see it has its uh, border going all around. I saved every bit of flax between these logs. I, slept, I saved the rags that were shaped around the logs of the windows. And they were in garbage bags in my attic. And I went through those, the, the cheeking rags, and I found costumes in there. I haven't gone through them enough to be able to really tell a lot, but there were some costumes in there. You can see that the windows have been replaced at one point. You see the, where there's tiny groove logs here. Recognize this lease? Oh, oui. the Maison Dave. The Maison Dave, Saint Jean. Yeah, Dave Saint Jean at uh, Karen Brook. This is in Karen Brook. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, this is a Cadillac. This is the luxury house. Oh, yes. This is the luxury house. Yeah. Again, it's symmetrical. You have these little, what they call, eyebrow windows at the top, at the one on the second floor which is really the attic. Is it still standing? Is yeah, it's in, a uh, site well, it's in uh, Claire. That was me. Um, we got this moving in a hotel, and uh, um, historical society paid $5,000 for the house, and then we got many work projects to and we didn't dismantle the house, we cut it. Um, and we moved it, and then we got federal uh, work projects. And we got groups of patina. Those were students, and we had them for a few pro seasons. And um, the house has particularities that are not seen too. anywhere else yeah. in New Brunswick. And it was, it was a grand, grand house. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, yep. you've got pictures. Yeah, I do. Uh, you can see raised panels up here. These are all raised panels. And then you see there's uh, a board, and then there's another board that's figured like the top of an armoire. Mm -hmm. It goes around, it goes around, all, all the way around. There, at one point, I think there were some brackets here. They come up. I've got slides of this too, but that slide is stuck in there and I don't know if we're going to be able to get at it. These are the panels. These are the raised panels in the living room. This is an ionic column that goes up next to the windows. And this is the under, you see the chair rail at the top of the slide? Mm -hmm. And then there are two horizontal raised panels. Mm -hmm. This is indigo blue. And this is burnt orange. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, even it's so blue. I saw that and I fell in love. Um, and original color, never repainted since it was built. But back when this was done, color wasn't considered important. 
colors only become important after antique dealers stripped every piece of furniture between here and Timbuktu. And they realized that the ones that had escaped were worth more because they were painted. The original colors. This is the top of that column. Top moldings, and then you have a rope molding. It's not a rope, it's a, it's a molding carved to be like a rope. And this is that raised panel ceiling I was talking about from the, like in the Avar house. I think that building is about 1845, something like that. Around there somewhere. Is that you, Lise? <laughs> this is upstairs. The ship's knees are huge. It's one of the containers. Okay. She looks like a French lady. <laughs> from the from the sixties. I had a cousin that did the uh, that worked on uh, photographing houses in New Brunswick. This is the Colmel House in Saint Basil. This is a, an original fireplace. It's in their garage now. But you can see that the influence from Quebec here. And that they would call this type of a thing a Gaspésie. You can find that on the Gaspésie, where the side goes up and curves up under the eaves. This is a fabulous house. I don't know if it's still intact or not. I know the house is still there. But I don't know if the wonderful stuff that was in it is still there or not. This is the front door. You can see the door has been replaced. You can see the side lights have been have been covered over. New windows, unfortunately. But on the back side, the old windows are there. I think it's 12 over 8. You can see that beautiful. Can you see these diamonds? Yeah. Carved into the eaves. This is the way they handle the, the roof. These are, these are the roof rafters. And then they have a piece that comes like the elder house. On well, the elder house, it doesn't have the curve, it goes straight. But this has that curve going up. And then underneath is a curve again for those wards. This is up in the attic. While I was there, there was a beret. And I knew that no one was using a beret for anything. So I said, Madame Corneau, would you like to sell your beret? She said, yes. And I bought it. Wow. The beret is for breaking flax. The whole downstairs of this house are all raised panels. Under the windows, you have these Rococo. They're not really Rococo, they're Baroque. Rococo would be not symmetrical, but these are symmetrical. Going through well. Partly. This, this is because of a corner. There's a fireplace or something near there. But the doors in that house were four feet wide. You could drive a Volkswagen through that house. <laughs> Volkswagen Beetle. This is a ceiling, just like the ceiling in the Avera house. All pine, and sometimes these, these ribs, they look like they're just out there. No, those, these ribs are two and three inches thick, going up against the log, the rafters of, of the house. Ship's knee. is the Peltier Marquis house in uh, saint -Egat. Now that is not a log house. That is a timber frame house. Where they would put, they would put the framing of the house together like you put the framing of a barn. And then they would put uprights in between and then board it in. And in between those boards they put buckwheat hulls. And you have this archway here to open up the rooms a little bit more. And under this wallpaper, there are the original um, pine boards.
This is a live fire in a little. See the, uh, the ingenuity to keep this thing rigid. They have these two pieces going all the way up and attaching two parts of the roof braces together. Just a menagerie of, uh, of timber. That barn is gone. This is a barn in Frenchville that's gone. The original barns, of course, were just like the houses all along. And then they would build these sheds onto the sides to change the roof line a little bit, and sometimes the sheds went all the way around to create more space. Or you might build another barn next to it and have a double barn. John Grove barn in Grand Isle. It's gone. You can see it had to go all the way around. So I've had a lifetime of heartbreak watching these places go. Mm -hmm. This is the Willette farm where they have the, there's still a roadside cross there. They have the barn. You can see it sinking. They have the cupola up there in order to keep the air flowing inside the barn so that the hay would dry, would stay dry, I mean. You didn't put the hay in green, that's for sure. This is the same barn from another direction. You see the St. John will go off in the distance. Bar before it got its new siding on, up, at, up on uh, Flat Mountain Road, go up from, from the uh, Lakeview. A double barn. These double barns were brought to the area by uh, Dr. Fauché. And Dr. Fauché was from uh, Drummondville. And so he brought the idea of the uh, double barn here. This is the double barn. This is the Fauché barn. It's the one he built. Well, it's an American style barn, that's a double barn. There was one like this uh, in New Canada. Not far from, uh, I think it was at the, the pond there. Yep. I cried again when I saw that go. I cried a lot. This is Albert Sears barn in Hamlin. And uh, you see the shrine here to protect it from fire. Right next to the gas tanks. <laughs> you know how it went? By fire. Do you know how the fire started? You're not going to believe this. A border patrol guy burned it down. Because he thought that people were coming across the river illegally and staying in that barn. So he burned it down. He was prosecuted but that didn't return, that did save the barn. This is Dona Chassé's barn on Church Road in Frenchman. It's gone now. You see, it's starting to go here. This is the barn in St. David. I saw a photograph in the Madawaska Historical Society albums where you could count 14 of these barns between the Fournier Road and the church. There isn't one anymore. But 14 barns like this. Some, some are American barns. We call American that gamble shape. But other ones were Arcadian at the same time as types of solutions. Because in 1922, potatoes were selling for $10 a barrel. I noticed that in a farm study that half the barns in Worcester County were built in 1923. And uh, barrels were $10, $10 a barrel for potatoes, which is a good price now. It was a fabulous price in 1922. And every farmer doubled their production the next year. And how you doubled your production is you built another barn because barns went on horsepower. Farms were on horsepower, not gasoline. So you needed another barn for hay to 
fuel those horses. Uh, do this as a sear barn. Young Tiana, Jean Tiana in, uh, in Lille. He's right, he could be Grand Isle or Lille. He's right on the parish line. He was a member of the Lille parish line. That, this one is still standing. Well, interesting. Moving those, what is the, that configuration of those windows? It's pretty haphazard, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not so sure that it's still that configuration. I think it's just the lower ones now. And I don't think those extra, those are doors. Oh, okay. Down there. Right. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah.